Um, well, another another arm of, of the underground, uh, the final frontier, uh, you know, improving what's what's out there, uh, kind of in the tech realm, but also in the operational realm, and also being able to take advantage of the digitalization of AEC workflows, particularly the field crews. You, you've heard of uh, crowdsourcing. Well, a part of the mapping puzzle uh, is, uh, as we've seen and heard about, is uh, could be uh, crew sourcing. But um, we've got Danny Petreca from Locust View. And uh, Danny, uh, the floor is yours. Look forward to hearing about this. Great. Thank you, Gavin. And I really like the term you just used, crew sourcing. I am going to shamelessly steal that and use it in future marketing efforts, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, can you see me and hear me okay? And can you see the first slide? Yep, we can, we can hear you and we can see your slide. Go ahead, sir. Super, super, thanks. Okay, so let's dive right in. So first of all, quick introductions. My name is Danny Petreca. I'm the Vice President of Business Development here at Locust View. Um, I've been in the, the, I would say the utility geospatial market for about 20, over 20 years, working mainly on the system of record side of, of electric, gas, water, telecom utilities, and, and how they deal with this, you know, design construction GIS workflow. Um, and really what we're going to talk about today is how we can, how we can digitize uh, construction crews or, or crew source data collection and what we feel is really the last gap in this workflow. So um, a, a quick view of, of what we're going to see here. Uh, so we're going to outline this idea of what's this workflow about today? How do utilities typically go through it? Um, and why are they using lots and lots of paper still today? It, it's a really tricky thing. Um, and then we will look at a bunch of case studies for folks that are actually taking the next step, either of their own volition or they're being pushed by new requirements from utilities or regula regulators to capture much more accurate underground data. Okay, um, quick view of who Locust View is, and uh, since we're probably new to, to most of you, um, we're a global tech company serving utility and telecoms with what we call a digital construction management solution. Um, we like to think we're different than most vendors out there because we were born out of a deep research mindset. We didn't build a product and go find a solution, uh, uh, something to solve. We actually built this solution hand in hand with utilities in the industry. So uh, this kind of partnership is really imprinted in our, our DNA. And what it allows us to do is develop best practices through these partnerships and um, with the industry. The result is that our software matches construction workflows. We're not a, a, a software company trying to, to fix something that ain't broke. Um, and this, this pattern of partnership has resulted in good success in that half the, the 20 largest utilities in the US have over 4,000 field workers on a daily basis using this solution. Um, and um, we, we owe our success to our DNA and to the idea that we strive to solve really hard problems. And um, really, one of the biggest and most pervasive problems we see in almost all utilities is the use of paper in the construction as building process. Um, and our mission is to solve this very difficult problem. I mean, I think back to my 20 years on the GIS side of things, we used to talk about design and GIS, but we would always magically skip over the discussion of as building with utilities. And now it's crystal clear to me why, because it's a very difficult problem. Um, but uh, we think uh, we can solve it by deploying digital construction that digitizes the entire construction uh, workflow from planning to close out. But let's take a closer look at the problem and what's causing it. So what you see on the screen is a typical design construction to GIS workflow that's in place at most utilities today. Um, you know, the closeout side on the right, the engineering side on the left, the design is typically done in a graphic work design system in the office, integrated with work management systems. Uh, a paper job packet is typically sent to the field. The crews, they, they collect paper as built and forms and eventually that, that paper makes it back from the field and the GIS is manually updated or, or some people are guilty of this, the crew simply hit the easy button. They check the box that says, we built it exactly as you designed it. 
which if you've ever spoken to a utility, you know that's not true. 90% of designs change in the field. Um, the workflow is wrought with inefficiencies. It's got manual processes and it results in data quality issues and massive mapping backlogs. We hear of up to 30, 60 to 90 days for uh, from construction complete for GIS to be updated. Um, we all know what that causes. This, this causes long cycle times, uh, manual project closeout. It, it's laughable that we do that in this modern day and age and inaccurate facility maps to say the least. The inaccurate facility maps as far as location and infrastructure and then poor grid data, really poor grid data that's supposed to run the quote unquote smart grid. And all the issues that this causes, you know, that's what this entire conference is about. It's about improving the accuracy of, of buried infrastructure. Um, it's improving the way buried assets are designed, constructed, recorded, and managed. And this is imperative if we're to achieve improved safety, to reduce or eliminate accidents, and optimize manual workflows while we're at it, you know, provide some good to the utilities. So, you know, while utilities might think this workflow is good enough, uh, things are changing and pressures are mounting. Uh, and it changes by, by vertical. You know, on the electric side, the utility digital transform, transformation is already driven by the increased demand for DER or distributed energy resources, so solar, wind, PV, and ADMS, which is an advanced distribution management systems. These are the brains that make, um, you know, energy efficiency and smart grid a real thing. These are getting accelerated due to COVID-19 uh, and more of a touchless uh, environment from utilities. Bottom line is that these advanced solutions need, I hate to use a marketing term, but a digital twin of what's built in the field. That's just not happening today. Now, utilities are spending millions of dollars over the past decades digitizing the left and right sides of this equation, pouring investments into uh, digital graphic work design, GIS, ADMS, but a gap in the middle is still remained uh, filled with paper. Now you, you go a little farther and you hear about grid modernization. So all the construction that has to happen to modernize the grid. Grid hardening, every time there's a storm or catastrophic wildfires, utilities have to change their infrastructure plans and take um, overhead wires underground or take bare wires that are overhead and put shielded wires up. And just the sheer glut of aging infrastructure replacement programs, all this is increasing pressure by driving a significant increase in construction activity. So grid transformation on the electric side of this scale, it's, it's mandating utilities to manage construction data from source to consumer 100% digitally. But, Construction as builts are still recorded on paper, introducing error and inefficiency to a critical workflow. Why is that? Well, let's take a closer look. Um, I hate to say it, but the answer is complicated. First of all, there's just a resistance to change. I mean, today, utility construction is managed using a variety of manual processes, they're paper based, or there are some partial digital solutions out there. And then there's the aging utility construction workforce. You know, they're resistant to adopting new technology and they, they'll they use paper until you rip it out of their hands, regardless of the delays it causes or the errors it represents. Um, furthermore, well-established systems in, in your typical utility enterprises, such as asset management and GIS, they've, They've tried to go to the field, but they don't provide the full solution that construction crews need for construction projects because they represent what's called the long cycle construction projects. They're planned in one month and sometimes they're not uh, completed for six, nine, 12 months. Uh, so utilities just try to get by with something that's really just good enough. Finally, it's, it's a very difficult and somewhat hidden problem uh, due to all the all the personas involved. So if you think about it, the workflow is tasked with taking a highly technical engineering output from the designers, translate it into construction or in, into instructions that a construction crew can use to safely and properly build the job to code into standard. Then the crew has to translate that into data that a GIS technician can use to update the GIS. This is no small task. 
you look at it, it involves three distinctly different personas. They work in different teams with different training. They use different systems and they speak different languages and are measured by different goals and KPIs. Very difficult. And finally, we found that th there also seems to be a lack of ownership of who owns the as building process. So if you work for a utility or at a utility or, or if you know someone at a utility, ask them, hey, who owns your as building process? Is it GIS, engineering or construction? Well, the designer, um, will uh, point to the crew or contractor as the owner. The crew might think the GIS tech is responsible and the GIS tech might think that the, that the designer owns it. Okay, so to solve this difficult problem, utilities need a different approach and they need uh, a fully digital process that's streamlined and paperless and they need the right tools that help them bridge the gap between the design side of this equation and the the as-built system, I'm sorry, the system of record side of this equation, but it's got to meet their personas. It's got to be built with a mobile first philosophy um, focused on the construction crew and user persona. Um, so where paper is replaced by a digital workflow, uh, basically that's what we're talking about here. Um, so uh, if we achieve this, uh, we eliminate the rework and we duplicate data entry greatly enhance the speed and accuracy and fidelity of data feeding utility systems. Because it's not just about positional accuracy, it's about how much data are you capturing and how soon can you update the system of record? Um, and how effectively can they produce as-built records that construction and locates can, can rely on? But you're probably wondering, is this is this really possible? Well, at Locust View, we think it is because recent advances in mobile applications and mobile computing, cloud technology, and, and more importantly, the availability of high accuracy GPS surveying have made a user-friendly and digital construction solution a reality. Um, so we, we feel confident that this idea of field crews Digitally capturing construction data is now a best practice. It's not a fantasy anymore. Um, so the good news is there's a lot of utilities already deploying solutions that realize this vision. So um, why don't we take a look at some of the case studies of utilities using digital construction with high accuracy GPS. Okay, we'll start with a company called VPI Charge. Um, this is a contractor serving some of the largest utilities in the West Coast of the US. In the middle of a project, they were really had the rug pulled out from under them. Uh, they were surprised with new requirements from the utility they served for high accuracy GPS digital as builds. It's not something they were used to providing. Um, and we'll talk about how they used our technology uh, to solve this problem. So um, the, the new requirements were, were pretty stringent. I mean, if you take a look at this, they were required to capture GIS or sorry, GPS locations during construction, so they couldn't do it after the, the pit was filled or the trenches were backfilled, they had to go within two tenths of a foot accuracy. That's 2.4 inches. That is, that's high accuracy location there. Um, and they had to collect points uh, every 25 feet for linear uh, assets. Um, they knew this was gonna be really difficult because of the sheer scale of, of the construction process. They had 35 sites throughout the Central Valley of California. 35,000 feet of trenching, um, auger bores uh, under highways and railroads, tons of primary enclosures. And they knew that they just couldn't have a surveyor sitting around all site, uh, sitting around on site all day to collect this type of data. It would just would not be cost effective. So they, they were familiar with Locust View from a different project and said, hey, could, could we do this for, for this uh, electric uh, project as well? So we, they reached out to us and, and we obviously moved forward with the project with them. So um, why did they choose to use a digital construction solution rather than survey crews? Well, it it's really comes down to cost savings. They were convinced through their previous experience that a member of their existing crew who's already on site could capture the data that was required by their, uh, by their utility customer. Um, they also wanted to be able to be more nimble. Uh, a large service territory, they knew that having an in-house capability would allow them to 
um, deliver the same kind of data without having to manage an outside survey crew or actually several survey crews because of the, the scale of the location. Some survey crews wouldn't go into different counties, et cetera, et cetera. They obviously they had some concerns. You know, this mandate was very important. They weren't sure if they could meet the data accuracy requirements. They also weren't sure if adding this new set of responsibilities during excavation uh, was going to work. You know, it, was it too risky? How much training? What was the learning curve? Uh, you know, they typically just push this off to another provider, but um, they had to give this a try. Um, and the, bottom, the benefits they hoped to uh, achieve were obviously saving costs associated with not having to hire an outside survey crew, but also the intangibles of not having to coordinate schedules and timing uh, for crews and, and holding up construction while you're waiting for crews to, to show up. So uh, the project was executed pretty quickly and VPI Charge was, was capturing survey grade high accurate GPS data in, within days. It was a, a pretty straightforward configuration of the tool. Um, so here you can see the crews working with the unit in the field taking a shot of uh, duck banks in an open trench. Um, here you can see taking one of the shots of the openings of one of the auger bores which go under the railroads. Um, and this final picture here is they were able to go back and they were actually required to go back and capture GPS data on projects that had been completed before they started using Locust View uh, through the potholing process. So over six months of data collection, um, here, here are some facts and figures that sort of give you an idea here. Uh, 23 active construction projects. They mapped over 16,000 feet of buried linear assets. So uh, duct banks and, and tracer wires and, and all that stuff and captured almost 5,000 uh, photos along the way. Now, the, the greatest thing is that uh, throughout all of this data collection, they achieved a median GPS accuracy of 0 0.14 feet by using their own construction crews to do this. That was a huge, huge success to them. Uh, and above all, you know, uh, the photos, the ability to take thousands of photos along the way during construction was a huge value to them. Having asset data, GPS data, forms data, and pictures all in one place really helped them uh, manage and monitor construction progress well. So uh, successes and benefits, um, you know, the initial concern they had about, you know, is this going to disrupt my construction crews in their daily uh, routines? It, it never came true. They were successful in using construction crews to collect as-built data with high accuracy GPS as part of their daily tasks while the excavations were open and without an impact to their schedule or their processes. So that was, you know, check the box. Uh, can we do this and can we satisfy the requirement? That's a big check box right there. They also uh, didn't have to coordinate with outside survey crews anymore and didn't have to pay them. So they saw an estimated time savings of around 20%. And this was around project management, but we also automated the closeout for them. So they were getting automated data exports without having to do a, a week of, of paperwork down, down the line. They also realized an estimated cost savings of around 50% because of fewer man hours overall, um, because they checked the box. They were able to have one of their own crew members that's already on site collecting this data. Uh, the uh, the real-time oversight of the solution to also allowed them to spot when a, a crew member maybe was in a hurry and collected a, a low accuracy shot. So has the ability to flag a data marker and say, this isn't not within the 0 0.2, uh, 0.2 foot accuracy requirement you have, you have to go take that shot again. So that, that was helpful because then if, if a crew would take a bunch of low accuracy shots and then you backfill, they'd have to send out a, a vac truck out there to do potholing to take them all over again. So that, that was a good thing. Uh, and then again, all, the idea of, of all the photos they collected along the way, having a single home for uh, within the project container for everything that was done in the field was very valuable to them. So that's VPI charge. The next case study is a, a bit closer to home for this audience. Um, this is a contractor, electrical contractor working for Parks Canada. Again, very similar to VPI charge, they were also suddenly required to provide digital construction data 
during construction of uh, the electric infrastructure they were putting together for camping and RV sites in Alberta. Um, so very similar to VPI charge, uh, but what makes this unique is the remote nature of the sites. Uh, there's a low to no cell coverage in, in the area, so they required the solution to work offline, which we're fully capable of doing. Um, the project is ongoing. It's pretty early right now. I hope to update you guys in, in, in the future, but uh, very similar in that the project includes providing a full high accuracy GPS kit with RTK uh, to collect data uh, with uh, a list for all of their materials that they'll be using in the field, an automated creation of, of closing package, and more importantly, the as-built report that Parks Canada is requiring. So Atmos Energy, we'll move on to this one here. This is a uh, probably one of the largest um, standalone gas companies in the U.S. right here. Um, they are serving over you know three million customers in seven states in the U.S. So uh, the Atmos project is is a testament to the scalability we can achieve. Um, and to the regulatory drivers in the US. So the scalability of the solution, they have almost 900 crews in production today, uh, daily. The interesting thing is, you know, uh, since they are in many states and they have so many different crews, uh, they're not always utility crews. I would say 70 to eight, 60 to 70% of those crews are contract crews. So if you take this, this difficult idea of capturing much more accurate locational information about your buried assets and then you hand your data collection solution over to contractors who are not part of utility that makes it an even harder uh, uh, problem to solve all in all they deployed the solution they're in, in production and uh, overall they, they they're capturing the high accuracy data they are reducing the time against the gis by 70 percent and getting all the accuracy there now the other important thing about Atmos is that this is a unique example or an example of the unique regulatory drivers in the US for, for gas uh, tracking and traceability from the FIMSA mega rule. I'm sure you've all heard of that. This is a, a full solution for that regulatory requirement, but it's an example of how outside pressure pushed for the innovation for a digital solution. Um, another large utility in the U.S. Uh, in the West Coast needed to capture digital, digital construction data. I'm a little long on time here, so I'll, I'll wrap it up pretty quick. Here they use Locust View for joint trench data collection. Again, so now it's not just one commodity. It's gas, electric, telecom, really complicates everything. They've got 60 crews in the field. They're getting real-time project status, automated reports. And then finally, a telecom case study for a contractor in Mexico called Even Group. They're building fiber infrastructure for the uh, Internet for All program. Now, their goals are less around safety and uh, and more about reliability of service for Internet providers. So something obviously it's increasingly more important during these work from home days of COVID. Um, but similar to the Parks Canada customer, they'll be capturing digital construction data with existing field crews to create a, a high accurate, uh, high accuracy digital network inventory for their customers. So we'll wrap it up here. A couple more slides and I'll take your questions. With all these case studies, you can see that there is a common thread and a shared problem amongst uh, utilities that bury their assets, whether you're gas, telecom, or electric. They all have the need to improve their processes, but they also have lots of paper in the field. But they're all being driven to innovation by different pressures. Uh, on gas, it's obviously FIMS on safety. On telecom, it's competition reliability. On electric, it's, it's DER, ADMS, et cetera. Uh, they're all getting different pressures to digitalize their fuel crews. And, and our host, Jeff Zeiss, is an expert at, at documenting that, uh, how this trend is happening more and more throughout the world. And, and we've, we feel that the Locust View solution is ahead of the game with providing a solution that can benefit, uh, provide benefits across all these verticals. So. To wrap it up, some of the key main points, obviously utility trans digital transformation is increasing, um, but it's clear that there's still a ton of paper in the field during the construction process, but you're starting to see an awakening around GIS data quality and more importantly, facility map accuracy. Uh, the utilities are looking for a better way or they're being forced to provide a better way um, for this and more customers are requiring digital as-built and this is evidence and this conference 
is pushing things in the right direction. So um, we're confident that an integrated digital construction solution can not only provide that accurate data, but also streamline the process for utilities. We've proven that digital construction or construction crews can use this advanced um, uh, solution to simplify data collection in the field and create that digital twin during construction, resulting in as-builts that can be trusted. And for um, the utilities out there that resist change, you know, from that, why are you still using paper slide? Well, I, I like this this one um, quote from Free from Mullen that says, you know, we often resist change unless it is crystal clear that the alternative is substantially better. But sometimes it's useful to, to flip it around and put the default the other way around and change it unless it is crystal clear that the old way is substantially better. So with that, I will uh, stop and pause to, to take questions. Hey, hey, thank you, Danny. Uh, that, uh, yeah, good overview of the whole subject fairly generically, but uh, and while there are some questions specifically about Locust View, and I'm gonna paraphrase a few of those, but um, oh, about the about the term crew sourcing, I, I thought I came up with that 10 years ago for an article, but it turns out I found out that um, a bicycle club had used the term a few years before, although for <laughs> completely different. They were mapping where the free Wi-Fi hotspots were along some oh, of their wow. favorite routes, you know. And they, oh, cool. Anyhow, but it sounds public domain to me, so go forth and <laughs> propagate. I'll be sure to give you uh, give you props for that. There you go. I don't need that. But um, yeah, the, uh, questions. So. There's a discussion, you know, it, it depends on a jurisdiction or a state or a province or a city. Uh, they may require that this asset mapping is uh, stamped or reviewed by uh, a surveyor or a PE. Um, the data collection process, it, it's, it's gathering the um, positional attributes, correct? Is that uh, kind of positional that attributes along with all the GPS metadata that goes along? Okay. All the GPS metadata, so it could be reviewed because that—that's a, a you know well a discussion I hear at survey conferences is the anxieties yeah. over that. Absolutely so that, understandable. Yeah, and, and we get that from a VPI Charges customer when we started giving them the data mm -hmm. they required. They said, "Well, we need the uh, all the metadata associated with this." And once we once we dug into the format we were giving them, they they were satisfied with what we were providing. Okay. So, I mean, Locust View is, uh, you know, digital construction management, you know, it's sort of a, a, you know, a big area of what you all do. But this, uh, this mapping capability as well. So you've got uh, on mobile devices, uh, the Android, iOS, uh, I, I hate to drill into specifics, but I want to give people an idea of the operational workflow that you've got. You know, you've got the crews, the inspectors out there, the you know, construction supervisor is often out there. You've got construction workers. Anybody that can carry a mobile device is potentially a source of documenting these these assets. So, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that workflow and what kind of mobile devices, what kind of GPS peripherals, things like that. That's a great question. You're talking about the different people and the different devices. So, you, you know, we we have a best practice kit that we can provide, but we know that lots of utilities have their own um, mobile devices and own uh, GPS units as well. So we so we provide the solution in iOS, Android, or Windows in the field. Again, the Windows would be on a laptop. It's not too common, um, and it works as a as a native app. There, there's a web application that comes along with it as well that obviously runs on any browser. Um, our preferred kit is obviously we're partners with EOS, which is a Canadian company, and we use their EOS Aero Gold um, as well. But we uh, work with Trimble, and we work with other units as well as a customer would uh, would want. Um, as far as the the people using it in the field, you brought up a good point because if it's just asset data collection, like a VPI charge, that's pretty simple. The the construction foreman, or in this case, one of the one of the crew would just jump in the trench and take it. But for larger things like at Atmos, they would have the crews doing the scanning of the barcodes. Then they would have a field engineer come out and do the as building, but they may have an inspector come out. And again, a third user of the technology taking um, uh, QA, QC readings for the butt fusions for the plastic, making sure proper PPE was captured, all that sort of stuff. So 
the idea that it's not just collecting the underground data, that's really more the tracking and traceability piece. Digital construction is really about, like if you see this slide here, it's about all the other data that gets collected during construction, whether it's permits, or right-of-ways, or testing, or operator qualifications. So that, that's the cool thing about it is, oh, let me see, I think I paused that, there we go. Um, that's the cool thing about it is um, the multiple stakeholders within a construction site can all be contributing to the same job simultaneously. I see that. And uh, uh, could you give us some, uh, well, you gave some examples, but for instance, uh, um, you know, some of the places that have uh, mandated uh, this asset collection. Yeah, well, uh, you had, uh, I'm sure you already had, um, is it Rob Martindale from Colorado DOT? Colorado, right? yep. Yeah, so he was the one who first uh, inspired me and, and I saw him and had a discussion with him and then got hooked up with Jeff Zeiss about it. That was where I really started digging into the understanding of, you know, throughout the world, there's lots of requirements for this growing. Um, uh, I know Jeff's involved in the digital underground in, in, in Singapore and that's a huge uh, piece there. I think, you know, the, 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 the utility uh, I'm sorry, the FIMSA drivers here in the U.S. are very important in that. That's a regulatory driver for um, the digitalization of capturing gas data. Now, we evolved beyond that because FIMSA is really just about tell me what plastic heat lot number you use and, and, and where it is in the ground, not necessarily about as building. So uh, we're seeing it, it grow all over the place. And then, you know, even Parks Canada requiring someone to uh, to create um, an underground digital map is is for with high accuracy. It's happening all over the world and Jeff's blogs are a really good source for, for seeing where the latest and greatest is. Okay, and uh, there's a case to be made for sort of formalizing either at a project level or the, uh, you know, the client operator level, uh, who picks it up. I mean, when that trench is open, anybody out there could potentially be the one that captures that, that data. Uh, of course, it can end up being a who's on first, who would be the person. Uh, I talked to different outfits because we're trying to figure a workflow out ourselves is the inspector, the construction inspector uh, for a lot of outfits seems to be the logical person to do that because they have to document things anyhow. Yeah. So, and typically, you know, you know the sketches. And some of those are brilliant and some are just frightening, but yeah. What, what's your thoughts on that? Who would be the, the right people to pick up things? You know, I hate to say it depends, but in our experience, you know, I would say uh, it, it, it's up to the utilities. It's usually up to the utilities GIS team because they're the ones receiving the data. So they're the ones who have okay. to sort of sanctify what, what they're willing to accept. Um, one of our main users out in the West Coast, they initially let their, their crews capture the data, but found that either through, uh, through whatever adoption processes was wrong, they weren't getting good data. So what they did is they said, oh, we're going we're gonna to send a field engineer out to all these sites to capture the data for the crews. Now, there's a pro and con to that. One is it, it's, a, it's a, a different FTE to do this, but the benefit was that um, a field engineer could hit multiple sites in one day, whereas a construction crew is locked onto one site typically for a long period of time. Um, so it, it depends. Um, but the other thing is contract crews really complicate things here. And if you think about letting contract crews into a, a corporate network solution such as this, um, and the ability to train them on it is is a pretty hard task. And you know, with Black Hills Energy down here in, in Colorado, uh, they use they're across five or six different states. Black Hills Energy, and sometimes they're using Black Hills crews, sometimes they're using contract crews, sometimes they switch back and forth. But they can just fire up their tablet, log into the job, and continue collecting because they've all had a shared entry point to it. Okay, and then uh, as as usual, the uh, a couple of quick questions come in with only a couple of minutes left, but we have a little bit of time here. Um, who pays for the service? Uh, the utility owners, municipal, 
municipalities, the excavators. I'm sure that that all depends. Uh, I mean, there's a value across all parties. Who, who, who's paying for this additional uh, service? It's typically the asset owner, so the utility. Okay. Um, so, uh, but it differs. You know, if, if, if utilities have a hard time mandating the use of certain technologies down to their contractors just because of uh, just sovereignty and their ability to, through their contract, do whatever they want. So uh, typically we sell to the utilities, but sometimes um, the contractor who's been given this solution by a utility will say, just like VPI charge, hey, XYZ utility made me use Locust View. I could really use this on some other job I have over here. So a lot of times the contractor will actually um, purchase from us. And that's that that was the case with Even Group in Mexico, as well as VPI Charge and then that contractor in Canada. Okay, question from uh, Syriac J. Um, didn't see any mention of the use of drones for data capture. Any reason a drone could make a huge difference in delivery and time, although there's that processing step, it'd be my comment. Um, drones? Yeah. Um, so if you boil down what we do is we accelerate field data collection by attaching quote unquote sensors to our data collection harness. One sensor is high accuracy GPS. Another sensor is barcode scanner. We're absolutely considering other sensors like drones for, um, and I would say it's not just the drone as a mechanism, it's what do we put on the drone? And I would think mm -hmm. it's LIDAR and imagery to give you, um, I'm sure we've seen some of this in the conference already, you know, that, that view, that AR three-dimensional LIDAR uh, with a draped image over a view that you can go back to in the future and go out in the field and, and have an augmented reality view of that. So that's that's definitely something we're looking into. And, and a lot of the stuff I see in, in different parts of the world are really interesting for us. So not doing it now, but absolutely consider drones as another sensor for us to speed up data collection in the field. Okay. And then, uh, uh, yeah, that segues into a uh, uh, last question from Joshua about uh, the role of augmented reality in, in facilitating comparison of as built to as designed. I guess that's just a, a logical in, in use of what you're collecting, right? Yeah. Um, I can't see this question, but, uh, you know, comparing as built to as designed is really interesting to us because our goal is to actually digest a digital design from the engineering side, bring that into Locust View so that when we construct against it, we can we can validate materials, we can validate the, the compatible units and build materials approved for the job. We can also start to look at the spatial moves of uh, as built versus design. But um, it's a work in progress because um, it, your, your comparison of the design in the real world, it relies a lot on the positional accuracy of the design to begin with. So if you're doing a design in good positional space, either a CAD system that has a, a good GIS backend or a GIS design solution, it might work. If you're just doing design in CAD paper space, it kind of makes it hard to get any accurate um, comparisons of design versus built. And in rereading the question, actually, it's uh, there's uh, about collected data against the physical. I guess a QA and QC step with the AR is you've collected the data and it's, you know, digital representation. How is it lining up with the physical? I guess that, that could be how that could be useful. Yeah, definitely. Uh, these are all great ideas that that I think once once we get, you know, the, the hard part right now is just getting utilities to adopt this idea of construction mm -hmm. crews collecting digital data. Um, I, I'm all for AR and, and, and pushing the envelope, but you know how utilities are. They move slowly and, and adopt technolo technology at a, at a snail's pace. You'll get the one or two progressive, you know, visionary utilities who want to you know, adopt something cool and whiz bang, and we're happy to work with them. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's tough. It, it's a it, it's tough to ignore all the the cool new technologies out there with augmented reality and, and lidar. Right. Uh, the um, yeah, the technology is the easy part. It's the people, people and policy and bureaucracies. So thank you again, Danny. Uh